Welcome to CMMS Radio, a podcast and general resource for all things CMMS, computerized maintenance management software, from selection to implementation to help you make better choices and have a successful CMMS journey. We'll bring in experts along the way to help us learn more about CMMS, facilities operations, and much more. If you need help with the CMMS project, send a message at cmmsradio.com using the What's On Your Mind link. Suggest a topic, share your CMMS story, or ask questions. All right, thank you for tuning in. Today, we're going to learn about Siemens Sensei Predictive Maintenance and the Journey Story with special guest, Niall Sullivan. He's the head of marketing for Sensei Predictive Maintenance, and he hosts the Trend Detection Podcast on Siemens.fm. That's where you can consume all of their podcasts, and it's also wherever you listen to podcasts. So, Niall, welcome to CMMS Radio. (laughs) Thank you, um, Greg. Thank you so much for the invite. I'm, I'm not used to being on this side of the mic, but um, uh, yeah, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. So let's let's give it a go. Absolutely. And you and I have been working on trying to get this set up. We got to deal with the time differences and all that kind of thing. So, you know, for me, when it comes to these connections, it's just like we bumped into each other somewhere out at coffee or whatever it might be. And I want to understand if you could tell us how did the the journey into the world of maintenance and technology start for you and then bring us all the way up to today where you're at Siemens? Yeah, so um, I could probably spend the whole episode um, talking about my, um, my past, but it's, um, yeah, it's been quite, quite a crazy journey. So interesting as a podcast host, my original background was in journalism. So I, I did that university Oh, God, how many years ago now? I left about 30, well, 14 years ago, I left university and doing journalism, expecting to go into the new, traditional newspaper industry. But what actually turned out is at the time, there wasn't a digital, you know, there's a lot of digital now, but at that time there wasn't, and there wasn't a lot of jobs in newspapers. So struggled a bit to get a job to start with. But actually what happened, I, I started working for the Yellow Pages. So you might know in the in the States, well, yell.com. Um, so I started writing websites for um, small to medium size businesses like builders, plumbers, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, because I was a copywriter, I love writing. I've always loved writing since school, you know, to um, that's why I did journalism at university. And then I sort of fell into marketing and technology marketing always by accident, actually, because um, I applied for a job to be like a web Web, you know, website um, admin, so updating the website for an ERP software company. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't get that job, unfortunately. But a few months later, they um, returned to me prior email and said, oh, our digital marketing person's leaving. And we actually really love your interview and, you know, what you said and stuff. So would you like this job, basically? And I thought, never thought about marketing as a career, never thought, work about, thought about working in a technology company at all. But I was like, well, this sounds perfect for me it's got all the stuff i love and then yeah from there um oh, i go to detail of every job i've sort of jumped around a few times but i've worked for tiny little companies sort of 10 person startups i've worked for a hundred person company and now I work for a three hundred thousand person company so i've sort of got a broad range um i've been the only marketing person i've been part of a team i'm a obviously a leader as i am now of a team so i've got very broad um yeah yeah very broad experience in that sense um, but obviously things changed fundamentally when I um, joined Sensei. Um, so I've been with Sensei now, obviously Siemens. Um, it's three years next month, actually. So if you combine Sensei and Siemens together. So um, it's been quite a journey. Um, I've, you know, I managed a team of four now. Um, and yeah, and so which led to the acquisition in June 22 of, um, of Sensei. Um, and since then, we've been sort of integrated and working and collaborating with our sort of Siemens colleagues around the world to sort of sell, deliver, and get Sensei out there. And that's exactly what Siemens does. It gives us a big sort of boost in terms of our reach, in, in terms of selling um, and delivering marketing, uh, delivering Sensei in customers all around the world. So it's been really exciting time. It's been, as everyone says, you know, it's like click your fingers. Three years seems to have just flown. Oh, so much has been packed into the last three years, particularly. But um, I absolutely love—I um, love what I do, and 
I'm very, incredibly biased, but the Sendside product is by far the best product I've ever um, had the pleasure to market out of all the different companies. I've worked in lots of different industries. Um, but yeah, in terms of this one, it's the most exciting and most innovative product I've worked with. So I hope that, that is quite a long introduction, but hopefully that um, covers a lot of things, Greg. Or yeah, it's, good. It, it's ideal. It's excellent. And so you're you're kind of hitting that sweet spot where you're really excited about it and it's the technology that you've enjoyed most when it comes to marketing. So I was going to ask, I kind of wrote this out, has being in marketing for this amount of time and you know working with so many people that are in maintenance and digital transformation around these experts, how has that shaped your understanding that evolves of maintenance, maintenance, maintenance best practices, and how Sensei really makes a difference in the world of maintenance. Yeah, I think I think that that's a really interesting point because as marketing people, often uh, there's an assumption that oh, we don't need to speak to customers because you know sales speak to customers, and and you know we just do what we need to do in the background. But I've always been a, especially in the past few years, Sensei and leading up to Sensei, that we're sort of much more than that, and what we should be doing is talking a lot more to our customers about, you know, what, what are the challenges they're facing? What are the pain points they're chasing? Uh, uh, what, yeah, what are the pain points they're facing today? Um, and, and to continuously do that as well. It's not just a, you know, once every five years job. So it's, it's doing it much more regularly to get, to, to get in their head and understand from their point of view, what, what is happening. Um, but I think as a, you know, since I predict maintenance as a, as a whole within Siemens, we're very good at, understanding our customers, listening to our customers. The product team are particularly fantastic at, you know, really building close relationships um, with customers to understand, you know, and develop the product in a way which which um, will help solve some of the problems day to day. Because it's very easy for us to go off on a tangent and go, oh, that's a cool feature, let's do that. Oh, that's a cool thing, let's do that. Um, but we actually know these things are going to make a real tangible impact because we're regularly speaking to our customers um, but like I said, from a marketing perspective, it, it's just not done often enough. And you, and what's left is marketing people who are writing, I don't know, writing blogs or maybe recording podcasts. So it's a bit more rare, I think, um, in some cases. But they're not understanding what they're, <laughs> you know, what they're producing. They're just sort of churning out content for content's sake. But my philosophy is, <laughs> and I'm no expert. Uh, even though you know I've worked in the industry, but and I know and I can hold conversations. I speak to customers. I've been on um, at events, on booths and stuff, and spoken to people about sense. I can do that. But the real value, and that's where the podcast comes in, is I'm taking the expertise and, and fantastic colleagues within um, Siemens and Sensei, um, taking that knowledge and pushing it out into the world because they're they're the real experts. And another thing that re has really impressed me over the past three years is working with such you know, real dedicated, knowledgeable colleagues. I think that's one of the, one, one of the best things about interacting with not just the clients, but the experts on your team or even externally, you get this exposure to the information and you go beyond, you go beyond buzzwords and conceptual understandings and you get real or what I sometimes call real time insights about how it's impacting this individual and they all see it from different angles. And I think it's brilliant because this is what we all want and what we all need. How on earth are we otherwise going to connect with so many different people and curate such important information that's real, that's actually happening instead of, like you said, just creating content for content's sake, which is kind of it gets you it gets you way off track it's beholden to something else so i like that you're passionate about that i wanted to ask another thing specifically about the podcast what is your favorite thing sure. about being the host of and interviewing all these great people on the trend detect the trend detection podcast what is your favorite thing about it if there's one thing oh well it yeah, there's probably there's probably a few things, but you might have even answered the question there, Greg. It's really um, what you were saying before. It's really the people you interview and the um, and the knowledge you gain. Because again, you can 
do as much Googling as you want and pick out and read articles and things and take information that way. But until you, you, you know, you'll be able to tell me as well. You, when you talk to people and have a conversation, and, and like I said, it's set up for us today, just have a normal conversation. That's how I approach podcasting as well. But you could just learn so much. They could, you know, things that I would never, you know, have thought of or an angle I never would have thought of. Um, so for me, it's that. It's building a knowledge of an industry, which I said before, feeds back into our wider marketing. So it's not just we reuse the content in lots of different ways. That's one great reason for doing it. But the other reason is, yeah, it's just my own personal um, knowledge. But and it's, I also just love um, it's that journalism instinct. I mean, I never became a journalist, sadly, but it's um, it, it's quite nice. That it's come full circle that I can use some of these skills um again which i probably never would have dreamt if you told me 10 years ago i'd be doing things like this i'd have said you were crazy probably but um it's given me it's opened doors to new opportunities like recording podcasts being a a guest on a podcast or being in a studio and recording podcasts as well i don't know if you've done that and greg too often i know you you did the big event we were talking about just before as well but um it's, it's opened doors to new like new opportunities and new experiences whether it's the guests or whether yeah so that's that's how i can summarize it i guess yeah and there's i i think just that question alone could be an entire episode or maybe (laughs) even a series of episodes because there's so many things that we we as hosts can get from the podcast experience but i think for like for me similar to you it's that connection and we get these multiple levels of exposure of insights and real stories and meaningful impacts. And, you know, for a lot of people in the world, they're like, ah, that's a bunch of hogwash. It's not, it's not, um, it's, uh, it's impactful. And for me, I think this idea that so many people can learn from what those episodes are, but it's one person at a time, which is absolutely fine. I like that, uh, Siemens has a dedicated Siemens.fm for all the podcasts that Siemens puts out too. I think that's really good. So I want to switch it uh, away from that. So we were talking about how the podcast plays a role in the evolution, your learning and all those types of things and what your favorite things are. But here's another one. So when it comes to predictive maintenance, do you find that many people misunderstand predictive maintenance and how it differs from preventive maintenance? And yeah. How so? <laughs> yeah, um, it's a really good point. It's part of the reason why we we pr- we produce so much content as a team because what um, and thing and the markets matured a lot. Predict maintenance market has matured much more. If we, I went to an event last year with with Siemens, and I was walking around with my with my boss, and we saw a lot of the stands now say they do. You know, now say, and it's important to say, they say they do predictive maintenance, which is a, is a problem for us because it creates more competition, even if really underneath the surface, they're not really doing predictive maintenance. And that's and that's where the problem is because a lot of tools, a lot of platforms out there, they, I think they put things like AI and Gen AI and they put it, and they put it on there and they say they do predictive maintenance, but often what, they're do, what they are doing is condition monitoring. You know, so it's monitoring the current condition of, of a machine and they can understand the condition of a machine. And usually it's on a very small number of um, machines, but whereas Sensei predict maintenance is much more focused at scale and where it's really innovative, it, it can monitor any type of asset um, across whole plants. And is, you know, with some customers, it's like eight, 10, 12, um, you know, plants that they're monitoring in one, in one platform. So um, that, that's how we would define predicting maintenance and there's not many to my knowledge um others out there that couldn't can at least on the scale side you know um do something similar to sensor so yeah so i think a lot of providers put predictive maintenance on as it you know it's the cool um term at the moment um but in reality if you look under the the skit it's it is a lot of it's just predict. Uh, sorry, a lot of it's just condition monitoring, and there's nothing wrong with just condition monitoring. So you've got to start somewhere. But it's when you try and label it as something else, is and and it confuses the market, makes jobs like myself and other colleagues job harder trying to differentiate between them. It does. So that and it was one of the reasons I asked the question is not just that. So that that was one perspective that I knew was there. I wasn't sure if you were going to bring it up or not. 
but I think in the end, the real the real issue is for clients out there in the world globally that are in need and they need to get educated. Sometimes they do that a little bit too quickly. And then you've got various organizations where certainly from a marketing perspective, and I'll say it, oh, wow, new word, buzzword. Uh, everybody's talking about this. And you know, in the CMMS world, it, it seems like everybody's number one, the number one CMMS. And <laughs> that's just not possible, right? So the customers, the clients, the users of these solutions out there, are in a, a greater need of education and understanding, which is why I wanted to try to differentiate it. So one thing uh, that's common to many CMMS platforms is the asset management and preventive maintenance. But I wanted to ask if from a predictive maintenance perspective, if it's the demand work order scheduling, the unplanned failures that actually contribute to the development of a proper predictive maintenance process or process within an organization is I, I'm just curious what feeds into the development of a predictive maintenance strategy. Is it the failures that give you more information for that or is it the existing PMs? And I think ultimately we want to reduce unnecessary PMs. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. So I guess the way we approach it uh, and again, you know, to my mind, it's quite a unique perspective. Is that there is a lot of focus on technology, and technology must solve, you know, solve all. But what I think we've found over the or over the years, through numerous successful and maybe unsuccessful projects as well, that it's actually the human or the maintainer um, input is equally important. So I guess an exa a great example of that is so when a a case is raised in sensor, you know, to direct attention towards a um, a machine that might, you know, needs some level of, of investigation. Once the maintain, maintenance person's actually gone in and investigated and decided, yeah, it's fine, or they've done a repair and it's fine. When they go to close the case, they actually provide feedback at that point. So they, they give it a smiley face or unsmiley face to say, unsmiley face, that's not a word. But anyway, so happy or unhappy face to say, this is good, you know, this was a good case, it, you know, it was correct. But then they could also provide their um, contextual feedback into that, um, which helps us to learn whether cases are being raised correctly for a particular customer. We can adjust things as we go. So like I said, it's great. And we need data to get started on a predictive maintenance um, strategy. But equally, the, the you can't um, you know, discourage the, the human impact of things. And then when you take, sort of new functionality we brought in very recently, um, you know, Gen AI functionality, um, that becomes even more important because that's what we're using to sort of, you know, to, to take it to the next level, let's say as well. So with the, with the generative AI, when, when we're leveraging that, and I don't know how much you can tell me about the, the actual technology, right? I want to be careful of that. Anything yes. that's actually, you know, inside info, but what I'm always thinking about with AI, and this is another area where we see a lot of companies, we've got AI, we're bringing in AI, we've got this, we've got that, and it just doesn't go very deep. So that's one concern. But with generative AI, does, does that really come down to who's telling it how to learn and what to learn? In other words, is there still a risk with generative AI that it's set up and they start running with it too soon and it's getting the wrong information and then carrying forth with that wrong information? Or is that something that's kind of a misnomer? I'm just trying to learn about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's something we always say, not just about Gen AI, but um, there's good data versus versus bad data. So, um um, but I guess the key thing for for Gen AI to work is it's only uh, it's probably a misnomer. You probably think, oh, you need lots and lots of data to get, to get started with um, Gen AI and, and predictive maintenance. But it's actually only very small amounts of data you need to. Uh, and it's not about training; it's for it to provide start providing meaningful in, insights. And obviously, with some customers we work with, we've been working with them for a number of years. And it's not to say that all data is. Perfect data is like if you check any CRM 
<laughs> of any any company, there's always um, not so good data, but it gives it gives um, sort of a starting point um, for it for it to work. And yeah. and what it's really about ultimately, because again, something that's always impressed me about Sentai is it's, it's a focus on not just how cool the technology is or look we, we're AI and we're this and that. It's actually it's always been a focus on what you know the end result for the customer as well. So the the out what the true outcomes that we can deliver. And it's the same with this Gen AI. We're not shouting about it as cool new functionality, but it's actually, you've got all this knowledge locked away, you know, all this data, all this knowledge and data locked away. And what this technology, the Gen AI technology does is help raise that to the surface in, in a contextualized manner. So it's very, just really great summaries. And then towards the end of this year, well, actually we've got a big event um, uh, with Siemens next um, month, Hanover Messe in Germany, and there's going to be, a hint towards the next, you know, what's coming next with that. Can't say much more than that. But what we ha- what we have at the moment is a, a really powerful way to con- provide contextualize much more and more. And what we're heading towards with this functionality is ultimately prescriptive. So it's it's giving advice on what should be um, what should be changed based on previous cases and similar asset types and that kind of thing. So there's a lot there's a yeah there's a, there's a lot more it can do we're only at sort of the the start and yeah. i know there's a lot more to come as well that's that's exciting because well one i've got an episode coming out fairly soon uh with an expert on the concepts of prescriptive maintenance and mm-hmm. a lot of people might think well we're doing demand work orders now we're doing preventive maintenance now we want to move into a predictive maintenance approach or philosophy within our maintenance organizations. And then what would come next? Well, that's where you could start looking at introducing the prescriptive maintenance approach, which is actually a very, very specific approach to maintenance that takes all of these different things, not just the data, but, but the, the, the overall outcomes. And then I, I don't want to go too deep into it because I didn't want to make this one about prescriptive maintenance, but it's really cool. Could I, could I ask that later on after that event, maybe you circle back and give us a little info that you're allowed to share at that time so that we can learn more about it? Yeah, exactly. The next, yeah, the next stage of it, I'll be yeah, more than, more than happy to, but, um, Good. but I guess what, what it's really, I guess what it's ultimately addressing is it, again, it comes, what we said, it comes up in, in all these conversations it's about um the problem with people and skills leaving businesses and that those skills leaving so what we're trying to solve is making use of the the data and the information you've got to try and fill some of that gaps of skills but it doesn't solve you know there's probably a separate conversation about what how can we encourage more people into manufacturing and maintenance etc but what we can do is help them make better use of what they the information they have already Indeed. Indeed. And that's, again, another one of, one of those things where what I want to always ask any of my guests is, are there any current trends that are happening in your space, in the space overall, when it comes to maintenance, maintenance and reliability that we should be concerned about? And that's almost always the very first thing that comes up is the skilled trades, the knowledge gaps that are being created by, you know, retirees and and people have to move on and live that segment of their life and the knowledge is going to go with them and it's going to be so negatively impactful. It's going to create a chasm that is very difficult to close. And I like that you had already brought it up before I even asked the question. So that's probably one of the leading or, or current trends that everybody's worried about. Yeah. Yeah. And if you ask me for, I don't know if you could, I think you're going to ask if there's any others, but to me, that's the one that's sort of forefront in my mind. Yeah. As it, as it stands, that's the, the really big issue. And I guess that Siemens as a whole, not that I'm speaking for Siemens as a whole, but I think that that's, you know, that's, really where the focus is and why developing such innovative products to to help support customers in that um with that issue because like i said it's not a quick fix because even if you start big recruitment programs and stuff that takes years to sort of ramp up as well so it's where technology can help solve that and like again it's a it's a focus the important thing is focusing on a business 
outcome because the the idea that cool terms like AI or predictive maintenance or gen AI, um, it that alone doesn't solve um, <laughs> doesn't solve the issue. It's the application and the people engaged with it that that, that really make the difference. Um, but it, it is just funny how so many people ask because because we mentioned AI, you know, what's under the hood? You know, how does it work? And you know, you know how does it do it? do it? Which is a fine question, but I get. I always use this analogy. I've used it on the on on the trend detection podcast before with guests. It's you don't ask how your iPhone or other mobile phone provider work. You know, you don't ask or wonder. Oh, what's the technology behind the phone? You just go. It works. It's cool. It does all this cool stuff. And yeah. that's the same thing I'd apply. But of course, the when you're purchasing enterprise software, you're paying slightly more for your for your time. But to me, that's still. Yeah, that, that still re- rings true. But what difference does it make how it works? As long as it works and delivers huge value for your business, then you know that's it, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is where I always I always question this concept of how much do you really have to know about everything that leads up to and into and post your role within an organization, within a manufacturing environment, or otherwise. It doesn't matter. I'm always kind of thinking about that, like. It's, it's a really nuanced thing, right? So you remember er, earlier we were talking and I said, I'm just a button, I'm a button clicker rather than, you know, I don't know how to do programming or anything like that. And when people hear something like, well, you were part of a, a CMMS build out and successful exit and all that. And they start asking me all these technical things. And I'm like, I don't go down that path because I'm over here focused on that. And I have the people that know how to do that. And this is the same kind of thing where, you have to understand it and go a bit beyond the concept to some real understanding. And then we can start leaning on the other experts that actually are deep in the weeds on what that technology is, what feeds that technology and what does that. So with regards to Sensei predictive maintenance, does it connect to essentially any CMMS platform or other platforms to feed it the information it needs to do what it does, or does it have to be a Siemens product? No, no. And this goes for any system. So when you talk about um, other manufacturing MES systems and other systems, that I think that's what possibly made Sensei Predictive Maintenance more, more attractive to Siemens in the fact that it doesn't. It can fit into existing um, infrastructure and, and system architectures already so it doesn't matter what type of plcs you've got or systems it, it can integrate into that um through for apis and and such things so um yeah so yeah not but not not tied to siemens technology but on the other side what there's always been a um a gap because we we were a software company but we didn't have the hardware and the connectivity side we used to work with partners which is fine but of course with siemens now we've got the the full package as it were in terms of you know if there's connectivity gaps if there's other you know other gaps then there's products you know most certainly find products to, to solve those solutions that's what makes siemens siemens really in terms of yeah. that such broad um yeah in terms of helping customers on their digital transformation journey they've probably got every um every product you could need yeah i, le- I learned about that at the brightly illuminate event that happened in raleigh we were talking about that before we started recording and I got a more comprehensive understanding and picture of the overall Siemens vision and how they really, really focus in on that long game to sustainable impacts for the clients. And that means a lot of different things, take it as you will, but it was really interesting and educational, you know, to hear some of these things. And of course that's off the mic, off the record kind of stuff, but it was really cool to hear the vision and the passion for all those types of things, kind of like what you were just talking about. So I asked you about trends that were concerning. I'm curious if are there any trends right now or things that are on the fore that you're really excited about that you think are going to be exciting for people around the world when it comes to technology advancements or anything else in the maintenance world? Um, I yeah, I I think um, I said to avoid focusing on Gen AI as the as the topic, but I think there is there's a lot of excitement in there as long as it's used in the right way. And I can see. The the strategy for um, for Siemens as a whole is very exciting. Some of the stuff they've announced, they've got. I think there was the event last year, SPS 
drives where they announced a, a co-pilot um, offering with Microsoft as well, which was very interesting. But um, so Siemens as a whole is doing a lot in that area and, and will continue to do so, no doubt. But again, from a sense I predict maintenance point of view, we're, we're along that track as well. And I think we're just at the starting point of that and what's to come. And I keep talking about what's to come, which I can't um, go into too much at the moment, but um, it's really going to blow, you know, blow a lot, a lot of things out of the water and provide, you know, serious, I mean, we're already providing serious value, you know, got great customer base and, and really happy customers, but this is going to really take predictive maintenance to the next level. And I realize saying that that's a very marketing thing to say. It's like a marketing headline um, ready to go. But um, I do honestly see that as the the game changer. Um, but of course, but of course, other you know other companies and competitive products are going to, going to be the same thing. So we could, in a way, um, be faced with a similar problem where everyone's instead of saying everyone does predictive maintenance, everyone does Gen AI predictive maintenance or whatever. And then the problem, you know, then then again, it's about how we position it compared compared to that um, right. compared to other competitors and how that. But that that's where I see it really. Um, yeah, that, that's really leading the way at the moment. All right. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to switch you into, this is kind of the fun segment <laughs> of CMMS radio. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that are just out of the gate, fun, and <laughs> no right or wrong answers to any of this stuff. It's just a nice way for people to get to know you. And we're going to start with the first one. What is your favorite music? Oh, that's a great question. Cause I love music. I'm a big um, vinyl collector. I lo- love um, love love streaming as well for its convenience. But I'm a I'm a vinyl man at heart. So based on that, I'm also um, a, a fan of older music. Let's say what a, you know from the 70s. So my favorite band. I'll, I'll just name one band out of all of them. So Queen is my favorite band by by far and away. Um, so I guess you could say, um, and, I, and for many years that's probably all I, all I listen to, but uh, it's got a bit more diverse, mainly after meeting my wife and opened me up to new um, experiences. But I guess you could probably say in that sort of dad rock area is probably my main area with some more modern stuff thrown in. And like I said, I've branched out, thanks to my wife, a bit more, um, mm. um, something that you could move to a bit. But mainly that sort of 70s, 70s rock, 70s soul, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. The stuff my parents would would have listened to, I guess. Yeah, yeah. This is no BS here. So before we started the episode and throughout the day today, a tune that has been floating around in my head is I want to break free. <laughs> I want to break free. And that's a Queen song. It is a very famous yeah. Famous Queen song, famous Queen video as well, of course. So, but. so, so, so interesting that that is the answer to that question. So, I'm just, I wanted to add on. Usually, I don't add anything on when you give those answers. Next fun question is what is your favorite sport or hobby? And it, on sports, it doesn't have to be one that you play, it might be one that you like to watch and support. And so, favorite sport and or hobby. Mm, well, maybe I could answer both. So I saw, um, so favorite sport is certainly, well, soccer, as, we, as you call it in the States, um, certainly my favorite. And, and I used to play when I was younger, um, had sort of trials at my local, you know, local city, Leicester City, actually. So uh, not in the top division anymore, but the one below, but many years ago. But I haven't played for quite a few years, but yeah, I still watch it um, regularly um and that kind of thing so yeah that's probably my probably my favorite sport um and a hobby because i'll put that place that slightly differently so besides collecting copious amounts of um vinyl um (laughs) is also um playing guitar so i i learned to play myself at university like most people a lot of people growing up they attempted it many times and given up because it's too hard and i feel a bit better because apparently eric yeah, false. But um, Eric Clapton apparently nearly gave up the guitar because it was too hard. So that that sort of spurred me on. And eventually, at uni, I'm right. I'm going to buy this guitar. I'm going to I'm going to sit in my room and I'm going to play, learn how to play a song. And if I can do that, once you know three chords or whatever, you're away. And then you sort of develop from there. So yeah, that's something else I like to 
sort of do in my spare time. Awesome. 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 And so here's the big one. <laughs> no right or wrong answers on this one. What is your perspective or philosophy on work life balance? Wow. And again, actually, that's a, that's a was that was that a random topic, Greg? Was that one that I don't know, I can't remember if we spoke about this, it, but it's a very topical one for me because I'm I'm incredibly passionate about that, both as a person, you know, me personally, but also as a team, you know, as a leader of a of a team, and it's it's absolutely essential. Um, and I guess to start with, I'm I work in slightly unusual arrangement. I'm very and Siemens, I have to say, are absolutely fantastic in terms of giving opportunities, flexible working. They could be open minded about offering people, and I think that's a real, it's a real benefit of working for the company. But I actually only work four days a week, so I I don't work Fridays. Um, so I think that <laughs> that probably says to you um, a lot, yeah, a lot more, yeah, a lot about you know how I consider work life balance. That I was feeling that the traditional line to five wasn't working for me, and Siemens have been open minded about allowing me to sort of change that. I guess, but it, but in general, I'm a I'm very very strict on this because in the past I used to be very, I think it's the excitement of being a manager or a leader and stuff, and I'd I'd have my work phone and go be like oh, I'm going to take it with me wherever I go, you know, even if I'm away for the weekend, with my wife and stuff, and it's just not the way to to live, is it? Because there's a life outside of work, and you need to switch off just for your own mental health. So I'm very strict with my team. Um, I've, and I've had comments before saying, oh, I'll keep my phone switched on. And I have to say, no, do not turn your phone on. You're on holiday, you know, and that's it. You know, very, <laughs> very, very strict. We're not, we're not robots. We, you know, we're all entitled to holiday um, and a break and to switch off. So unless there's some, well, there never is in marketing. That's what we always joke about as a team. There's never any dire emergency that requires anyone to, disrupt anyone's holiday especially when you've got a team of as five as we are someone else is always around to handle it or deal with it as well but as you can tell i'm very passionate about it both protecting my team's work-life balance so yeah they're not and i'm always you know and and the fact is i'm open-minded about because my own personal benefit i'm open-minded to different ways of working um and because ha- it's very personal to each person. That's what I've learned. Some people like being in the office. Some people like being at home. Some want to work four days a week. Some, you know, want to start early or whatever. But you just have to be flexible to individual circumstances, especially now as we're all mainly remote these days. Yeah. So you had asked about the impetus of the question. And it came some time back when... I thought, what would be really interesting to ask someone that would be highly personal and individual, yet applicable to maybe a person or two out here in the world that might hear this or see this. And this is why I say that there's no right or wrong answers, because you define it for yourself. But when someone can hear your insights, your perspective, and how how you approach this concept of work-life balance, it will help somebody. And I always find it to be very interesting. And I like to see how that kind of unfolds without me influencing it all. So the question got added in some time back as just something very meaningful and important to the person who's being asked that question. And it would resonate the same with somebody out there. We get all kinds of different answers on that. And when I say we, I'm talking about me, myself and I, I guess. Um, the It's just a really interesting question that people always have an answer for, and I want them to know that you're not, you're not wrong. Whatever your answer is, is not wrong. So that was the whole nature of why that question always comes up. But I'm going to start changing that later because, you know, later on, we're going to catch up on, uh, what you do at that next trade show and that you can update us on so that we can just keep people aware of what the innovations are. So, I'll have to come up with some new questions for you, which I will. I do that. That's my job. (laughs) (laughs) And I want to let everybody know, um, if you want to connect with Niall Sullivan, you can do that on LinkedIn. That's the best way to reach out to him. It's Niall, N-I-A-L-L, and it's Sullivan, S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. You can find him on LinkedIn and 
That is Sensei Predictive Maintenance. And that is a Siemens company. And Niall, I want to thank you for finally being on with me here on CMMS Radio. No, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for um, having me on, Greg, and being on this side of the, the microphone, not being the interviewer. It's been it's been really great just to chat some things through. Hopefully, um, the audience found it sort of in, insightful as well. Like I said, any questions, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll plug the Trend Detection podcast as well, as that's um, for predictor maintenance, IoT, digital transformation, anything. We cover quite you know, broad topics, but um, worth worth checking out. Um, as well, like like you said earlier, Greg on Siemens FM and all your other various po- podcast channels as well. And I'll uh, I'll put some things in the episode when I produce it so that people can, you know, maybe grab a a, a hot link and click over to it or some of those things because we want people to check that out. I've checked it out; it's definitely worth a regular listen. And we'll go ahead and close the show. Fantastic! Thank you very much. You got it. Did you find this episode helpful? Please send us some feedback, suggest a topic, or ask a question. Reach out to CMMS Radio if you need a co-pilot on your CMMS project. Visit cmmsradio.com and use the What's On Your Mind link. Thank you for tuning in to CMMS Radio, your resource for all things CMMS from selection to implementation to help you make better choices, learn from industry experts, and have a successful CMMS journey.